Ambassador Ahmed Wali Massoud, friends of Afghanistan, our beloved Afghanistan, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. And I mean every one of those three words peace, mercy, and blessings on our beloved country. It is a bitter sweet occasion today, bitter for all the reasons that Dr. Casey and Ahmed Wali Massoud and Lord Cranbourne have set out and all of us know. Our thoughts are in the Anshir, the mountains, the valleys, the rivers, the forests, wondering what is happening there with our friends. But we are here today in Cambridge to ask ourselves some difficult questions about the future of our beloved country. And I want to start by saying that for me, it is such a personal pleasure and honor to be here in the college that my father attended for a term in 1939 as a classical scholar before going off to fight in the Royal Navy in January 1940. It's a particular pleasure to see Sandy Gall and his daughters and granddaughter, the hero of my childhood, the hero of our television screens in the raffish days of independent television news at its buccaneering best, traveling the world and bringing the horrors of the world into our drawing rooms across the United Kingdom in such a courageous, and intelligent way. And as Ned Cranbourne said, for those of you who haven't seen it, so much of that is captured in this wonderful new biography just published of the Lion of the Panchir, the Afghan Napoleon, Ahmed Shah Massoud. So lovely to see you here, Sandy. Lovely to see Sir Nicholas Barrington, my boss in the embassy in Cairo, one of the great Orientalists of the Foreign Office, the voice of common sense, when so much around us was less than sensible. And then from the bottom of my heart, I cannot tell you what pleasure it gives me to see a man whom I met almost every day for my three and a half years in Afghanistan, President Karzai's National Security Advisor, my friend, my colleague, uh, a great scion of the Afghan royal family, uh, Zalmay uh, Rasul. It's so good to see you here today, sir. It brings tears to my eyes. Now, what I want to say is, has already been said in different ways by Dr. Casey, uh, by Ambassador Massoud, and indeed by like Lord Cranbourne, which is, that there is only one sensible solution to the horrors of Afghanistan. And that solution has been known uh, for centuries. It was obvious under the monarchy, those golden years when some of the older ones among us, including Sir Nicholas traveled to Afghanistan and saw what a paradise it was. And it is that there has to be a devolved and decentralized government, not one imposed from outside, but one which organically recognizes the diversity of the country and its peoples. Now, I first went to Afghanistan in the spring of 2007. Even before I left, as I started to read about the country, to talk about the country, I began to suspect that the so-called Western plan uh, wasn't a plan or a strategy at all. I discovered that the so-called peace conference at the Petersburg on the Rhine outside Bonn wasn't a peace conference at all. I discovered that the um, constitution designed by a Frenchman, imposed by an American, was a perfect piece of 18th century constitutional engineering uh, that bore no relation whatsoever to the uh, political history and geography of Afghanistan. I discovered that the generals 
uh, the American generals in particular, but the British generals as well, were completely out of their depth. And that the diplomats, and above all the politicians, didn't have the courage to look at history and geography and say that this is a problem in which the use or the threat of the use of military force is essential, but far from enough. It was military tactics, no political strategy, no economic strategy, no social strategy. I remember going down to Helmand and uh, visiting the British forces there. And a young officer in the Grenadier Guards who'd been at school with one of my sons coming up to me saying, can I have a private word with you, sir? Yes, of course. He said, it's not working. It's not working. I'm uh, training the Afghan police, but as soon as I leave them, they return to their old ways. And I tell my commanding officer it's not working. And he says, don't be defeatist, crack on. We're only here for six months. I remember flying down to Nauzad in one of those giant uh, Chinook helicopters with the Estonian ambassador to um, Afghanistan, Harry Tido. Long, greasy hair. He looked like the dissident he'd once been, very probably clad in a helmet and a flak jacket. And uh, as we, the helicopter landed in Nauzad in the outer beyond of uh, Helmand, where a, a, a company of Estonian soldiers, very brave Estonian soldiers, was dug in alongside the Royal Marines in a scene that looked like something out of the First World War. Harry Tino uh, said to me as we ran out and the helicopter lifted off and away, he said, I've been here before. And I said, what? He said, I was an officer in the Soviet 40th Army. And uh, I fought now, I remember, in Nauzad. And I told my troops then that the Afghans had every right to shoot at us. And my reward to, was to be sent off to a punishment camp in Soviet Central Asia. Anyway, we had the usual uh, happy talk the PowerPoints from the military, uh, the um, scenes which could have been out of Black Anna. We've advanced this far. What scale is that? One to one, sir, uh, today. Uh, and uh, we looked out across the trench at the Taliban, shooting at the Marines and the Estonians. And then at the end, the commanding officer said, Ambassadors, any questions? And I was too depressed any questions. But Harry Tito, the Estonian dissident, said, I do have a question. I have only one question. And it's this. What the fuck are we doing here? <laughs> and that, in a way, was a metaphor for the entire war. What were we, the Americans, the British, the foreigners, doing in this land of which we knew so little, uh, fighting a war which we never understood. I, mean, I remember so many discussions with Zalmay and President Karzai in which he expressed doubts about the latest military campaign. Where was it leading? It was pushing water round a puddle. It was squeezing a balloon. It was doing what we were doing to the Taliban what, uh, Taliban, what insurgents had always done throughout history, pull back across the border, across the mountains into Pakistan or wherever it was, out of the way of the Western forces. We knew then, uh, David Miliband, British ministers, even President Obama knew that the military approach on its own wouldn't work, that there needed to be an inclusive, comprehensive approach in which we used to use the analogy of a double-decker bus. On the lower deck of the bus, all the parties to the Afghan conflict, all brought together in a gradual process of dialogue from the bottom up. And on the upper deck of the bus, all the outside parties to the conflict, 
It upset me enormously that the Americans would never talk to Iran. They would never learn from the Russians. They wouldn't engage with the Chinese. Uh, they would talk to the Indians and a bit, of course, to the Pakistanis. But it was never done in a coherent way. There was no political approach. And I worked very closely with the tragic figure of Richard Holbrook, a man who had seen it all in the Mekong Delta, America making the same mistakes as a young foreign service officer, but could not convince a president who didn't want to displease the military uh, that what was needed was a long-term uh, political approach. Perhaps it was because the American Republic is constitutionally, and I mean that literally, incapable of the kind of benevolent overseas engagement which Afghanistan needed and still needs. So what happened then, what happened in these last few weeks, uh, what will happen in the future? None of that changes the underlying reality of Afghanistan. That when this country stabilizes, as it surely will, it will be on the basis of distributed power, recognizing all the constituencies of that great country, but in a balanced and moderate and tolerant way. It will need to be underpinned by the outsiders who've done so much to upset the stability of the country, and it will need to be uh, engaged with for decades to come. So we're now in a very dark hour, and all I would say to you, my friends, is that so often in this life on earth, the darkest hour is before, is before dawn. Dawn will come. Dawn will break over the mountains of the Hindu Kush. If the sun will come creeping down the valleys and across the plains of Afghanistan once again. So we must hold to the truths of um, our human existence and the truths of Afghanistan through these tough times. When I wrote my own book about Afghanistan, I rather pretentiously quoted the, or cited the uh, preface that that great historian of another company, Thucydides, wrote in recording the battles between the Athenians and the Spartans. And he said, I write this history to record the mistakes that men made as a katama es ae, a possession for all time, in the hope that future generations will read this history, learn these lessons, and not repeat the mistakes of the past. The sad truth, however, is that we do mistake, repeat the mistakes of the past, and the purpose of this conference is to make sure that we hold to the underlying truth about where the future must lie for our beloved Afghanistan. And I want to end where I began, where Sandy's involvement with Afghanistan began, in the Panchia. One of the happiest, among the happiest times in Afghanistan I spent was driving up the Panjshir Valley with my bodyguards, sometimes accompanied by the man who until recently perhaps still is Vice President of Afghanistan, my friend Amrullah Saleh. At seeing the, the groves, the river, the wrecked BTRs and T's and 62s, lying in the rivers on the, on the hillsides, seeing the scars of past conflicts, but also seeing the bravery and courage of the people prepared uh, to, in those days uh, to look at what they felt was a bright and inclusive future for Afghanistan. So thank you, another Zalmai Nishat, for all you've done to bring this conference together in some pretty tough times. We salute you. Uh, these are dark times, but dawn will come. 
and this conference is in its way uh, those first rays of light coming over the uh, Hindu Kush with the snow still on the peaks. So thank you all very much indeed. Thank you.